Well, good afternoon. And uh, on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency uh, and Congress, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, for what we expect to be a very interesting conversation today uh, on a vital topic. We've got joining us uh, Ambassador Danny Sepulveda and, uh, and Steve Feldstein, who will be um, more fully introduced um, shortly uh, by our moderator. But le let me just start by saying, um, we're pleased to have them for this conversation on building an alliance of techno democracies. Um, it's a really important topic that fits into a program uh, that the center has been working on for the past two years under our uh, great powers competition umbrella. We've been focusing on the geotechnology competition, uh, the race to, um, to excel in advanced technologies and focusing quite a bit on US and China and how we position the United States uh, to win that race in those advanced technologies and to protect our security, but also to balance the very important elements of uh, data governance and data privacy um, in, in all the challenging ways that democracies face and at the same time win the narrative battle uh, with authoritarian countries uh, who want to promote a very, very different uh, system of, uh, of dealing with rights um, with data privacy uh, in their effort to assert their point of view and their narrative and try to win that same race. We, uh, the center published a, a report uh, back in uh, December of last year that laid out um, some of our thinking on this question and some of the major um, framing items that we thought were important. Obviously, we have um, experienced a change of presidential administration in, in the interim. And so a lot of the thinking that uh, informed our series of events that included uh, administration spokespeople in the prior administration uh, now needs some rethinking because with the new ad administration, you get a lot of possibilities in terms of new direction. Some things won't change, but, but, but many things will. And so this is a great time for us to revisit some of these questions and talk to experts um, about where things are headed. I'm going to post a link to our December report um, in the chat for the benefit of our, our viewers today. Um, and again, want to just thank our, our participants. Our recommendations um, focused on several areas of this competition, including um, the need to develop some federal level data management, uh, data governance and privacy laws in the United States, restoring the office of the National Cyber Director, which was a recommendation of the Cyber Slayer Commission. But we also looked deeply at um, the need to manage supply chains, also taking into account the realities of our need to trade with some of the countries we're competing with, and the importance of alliances and working together with like-minded countries like Japan uh, and countries in Europe to achieve larger marketplaces and to get some, some leverage in these uh, elements of the competition. So we looked at clean network initiatives, investing in in R&D and high-tech manufacturing. And we know that supply chains obviously very much on semiconductors, very much in the news this week, um, but tried to bring onto the table all the elements that we thought were important uh, for this conversation. Uh, we have been working closely uh, with Japan specifically, including helping coordinate some discussions between the Japanese parliament and the American Congress on uh, cooperative ways we can approach it from a legislative angle. So there are a lot of ways that we can look at this question, but for today's discussion, I'm gonna hand it over now to CSPC senior fellow, Robert Gerber, who is, has just uh, retired from a 20 plus career, a 20 plus year career with the Foreign Service, uh, most of it at state, but part of that at the US trade rep, um, spent some time on Capitol Hill before that and focused quite a bit on uh, digital issues and digital negotiations. And so is very much an expert in this field in his own right. But uh, let me pass over to you, Robert, and have you introduce our guests and, and take us right into conversation. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Glenn, and welcome to our, uh, our panelists and our participants today. <clears throat> I'd like to start with a quick introduction of our panelists. Um, Ambassador Danny Sepulveda 
uh, served at the State Department. He was a real pioneer on digital diplomacy while he was coordinator for CIP as the Office of uh, the Coordinator for Communications and Information Policy. Um, prior to that, he worked on Capitol Hill, both for Senator Barack Obama and for Senator John Kerry. He also has private sector experience working in the startup ecosystem and knows a lot about technology. We also have with us today, Stephen Feldstein, who is with the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, Stephen also served uh, at the State Department in, during the Obama administration. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Rights and Democracy in the Bureau they call DRL. And he was also a Policy Director at uh, US Agency for International Development. And um, prior to that, he worked as a counsel for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So welcome to our two speakers. We're glad to have you today. So I will start to frame this discussion here with the uh, statement that Beijing has made no secret of its intention to, quote, beat the world at information technology. In fact, the PRC also seeks to export its model wherein an authoritarian state dictates and controls the digital airwaves. And this poses a major threat for free nations with implications for their own security and the broader goal of sustaining democratic societies worldwide. So how do we address this challenge? The first question is a framing question for Steve Feldstein. You recently explored the notion of a multilateral tech alliance in one of your essays. And could you explain what such an alliance could or should look like? And a second part of that is, as both a Pacific and an Atlantic nation, is the United States well positioned to advance such a framework involving like-minded partners like Japan, EU, uh, and the United States? Over to you, Steve. Great. Thank you for the question, Robert. It's really uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks to the center for hosting me on a, an important discussion. Uh, I look forward to uh, talking through the issues and, and really in hearing the questions as well. Uh, so about your, your question, you know, what does a multilateral tech, you know, tech alliance look like? What's the rationale behind it? You know, I think it's something that at the moment is a little inchoate in terms of actually understanding exactly what the concrete objectives of such an alliance would be how it would work, who would be part of it. And so I think there are a lot of questions on the table right now. Uh, I think the, you know, the first and foremost, we, we, we ought to ask, you know, do we need one and what would be its purpose? And this is where it, I think it gets really interesting because there's a number of ideas I've seen thrown out, uh, particularly from current uh, you know, officials in the Biden administration as they're starting to kind of work out you know, the rationale and the logic for such an alliance that ranged everything from supply chains, economic competitiveness, security interests, uh, particularly based around forging a stronger transatlantic partnership, and of course, democracy. Now, all these issues, to some extent, especially under kind of the broader rubric of tech, uh, are interrelated. Uh, and you, know, uh, you can very well see how the democracy impact of one type of uh, technology also relates to economic partnership, competitiveness, and of course, national interest. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's a question in terms of uh, how you orient such an alliance? Do you, do you structure it so that uh, it's really focused first and foremost on a set of security priorities? Is it more of a democracy alliance, something like, along the lines of the Freedom Online Coalition? Um, and so right now I, I haven't received kind of a clear signal about what it is that uh, would look like. And so I think that's sort of one of the opening questions we have to ask ourselves, you know, based on what one, what a policymaker perceives the overriding objective, that's how you would then want to structure uh, such an alliance. So, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there. Some people talk about 10 or 12 different countries ranging from, uh, so, uh, you know, some of the larger uh, governments uh, in Europe, Germany, France, uh, you know, the UK, uh, and so forth, uh, add in a few of uh, partners from uh, the uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Japan and South Korea are talked about, of course, Australia, as well as Canada. United States, and you get up to about 10 or 12 countries at that point. And that's more, more mostly what I've kind of seen uh, in terms of what something like this, uh, how it would, uh, it would appear in terms of membership. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot of that's still up for debate, debate. I think one of the big questions is, is that so such a small group that, you know, you're unable to kind of reach out to the broader part of the world that you're looking, especially the part of the world where you're looking to counter China's influence. Or does it make sense to have kind of a smaller core that would really kind of uh, push ahead, build consensus, and then you kind of build out 
so those are some kind of initial ideas on, on the table, uh, but there's a lot more to discuss. I would just add one more thing, which is that on your question of the US being kind of in between Europe on the one hand and Asia on the other hand, does that make it a good convening place, a power that can kind of play both roles in terms of bring in different regions? Uh, and I think that actually is an important aspect that the US can play. Uh, I think that kind of leadership, both in terms of uh, rebuilding frayed relations uh, with transatlantic partners, uh, but also kind of really showing uh, a strong interest uh, when it comes to engaging in the Pacific. Uh, I think both of those uh, would be kind of key pillars uh, to how such an alliance would unfold. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, over to you, Ambassador Sepulveda. What are your thoughts on such a notion, a League of uh, Democratic Countries, uh, techno-democracies, and what would the scope of that be, and, and how could we maybe operationalize that? Thank you very much, and it's actually it's really good to see both of you. Um, I'm particularly excited from a partisan perspective of where we are today. I, I served on the Biden transition. I know the teams that have come in very well, and um, and I think there's an immense amount of talent uh, and immense amount of ex experience in position to do a really good job around these issues. These questions may seem new, but but they're really not. We we had discussed in the Obama administration designing something of a D10, much like the G7, but a democracies of technology of 10 nations, including India and Brazil from the developing world around the idea of how do you ensure that um, cyberspace or the internet is a force for, for democracy with a small d, both democratic, uh, more democratic commerce, uh, so more services and goods and people can enter the market more easily because of the internet, and more uh, democratic from a democracy governance perspective. How can you get more voices involved in the conversation with fewer barriers to entry for participation in civic discourse? So, you know, we had a whole internet freedom agenda rooted around that, and it was built on the principle that the multi-stakeholder system should govern uh, or should govern essentially critical infrastructure and should be a part of any conversation relative to public policy in the space. And I still think that's the right framework. Um, it's, it, it is easier not to do something than to do something. So, and you can always come up with good reasons not to do something. So it's not my, I wouldn't even wanna engage in a debate about why we shouldn't do a, a digital trans, or transatlantic digital or, or a democracy, uh, a digital democracies initiative. The, my question is what if we don't? Because we haven't. So it, there is risk inherent in doing. If we don't do it, forms of governance are occurring um, organically without coordination, without negotiation, without deliberation. And you do have pockets of influence uh, coming first to market with regulation or policy or law. And as a result, driving that policy into other markets as well or other jurisdictions. I, I do think the threat from China is real. Um, I don't, however, believe that we can't both thrive. And I, I don't believe that, it, that China is a, a, an inherent adversary, right? That, that I, John Kerry used to say that they were neither friend nor foe, that, they're, that it's a very complex relationship where we share a planet. So in climate, just like in cyberspace, we're gonna have to find a way to coexist. So, the, but that's a longer conversation. We do have to first get our house in order domestically and then with allies and like-minded around how we wanna approach this challenge. But like I said, if we do nothing, you can just take an example. I'll take, give you two. The GDPR, which was brought to market by the EU um, and then exported and has been copied in multiple jurisdictions around the world was done so without transatlantic uh, negotiation or transatlantic negotiation or really, um, and it's driving policy. Uh, I think that we have to have an American federal privacy law to juxtapose. Um, and, and we will take a lot of what was in GDPR, much of it is very good, and put it into a federal American privacy law. But where we diverge could create interesting options for other markets to look at. And the key is to make sure that they're interoperable so that we retain the economies of scale, uh, scale and reach necessary for democracies and whatever whatever uh, cyber interaction we continue to have from a commercial perspective at least um, is can compete with the size of a market like China. 
I don't know if that helps. Yeah, that's, that's very useful. Sorry, go ahead, Danny. Did you want to add something? The, just the one last thing I would say is that we have a body of work to build on here. Um, mm -hmm. The when we were at, at in the administration, Brazil actually called together a group called the Net Mundial, and it essentially invited the whole world to come to Brazil, and it was a three or four day negotiation, uh, and actually. India objected to the to the to the outcomes of the Mundial, but generally, as a general rule, most of the world agreed to it. And I'll tell you, we 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 went there with um, our colleagues from Chris Painter's office back then, which was a, a generally a cybersecurity expertise office within state. Our colleagues from NTIA, which were generally expert in domestic and international telecom and technology as a commercial matter, and we were informed by Steve's. Steve's uh, office in, Mr. in what was then Malinowski's job over there uh, on human rights. And I think you can break these the issues into those three buckets, security, commerce, and which something that overlays both of them, which is, is, uh, is human rights and, and democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and the expertise in each is, is separate from each other. You really, there's no human being that is a truly expert in all three. And you need to have some sort of uh, team and coordinated organization for executing negotiating positions for the United States on these issues. Mm -hmm. And we need to elevate those. Like it was great that it was done at my level. I think that there are proposals to create a new bureau within the State Department to elevate it within the State Department. The NEC and the NSC have created positions to ensure that there's cross um, agency coordination on these issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that organically we're being pushed towards um, towards embracing this concept that we have to have a not a western view but a democratic view of how cyberspace should be governed great yeah that's really helpful you brought us some really important issues um i noted particularly you said that there are some foundations on there on which we can build things what happened in brazil the D d10 even uh Pr prime minister abe's uh data flows with trust initiatives there are some some there is some work that's been done in the last administration the the 5G Clean Path Network treads some of this ground as well, um, talking about how you know security, cybersecurity is important to to democracies. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you a little more detail on: Let's say we've agreed that this is a good concept, and we have an initial team of co countries that want to roll this out. Um, what what are the what are the key points, the key notes that we should be hitting on the keyboard? Is it the commercial and innovation opportunity here? Is it the cybersecurity, or is it the human rights? democracy one in which which path would help us get a, a greater consensus around this concept it's funny you asked that question I, I thought about that and i'd love to hear steve's answer and i bet and i would tell you that the answer to that question is going to depend on who you put in charge because who, whoever you put in charge will have a personal expertise in leaning towards one of those three buckets and we really need to be careful about balancing them because from, from i believe that Okay, security probably is is going to always be this the the first principal responsibility of government, but it shouldn't be so overriding as to disable us from being able to accept some degree of risk um, in order to advance either human rights or commercial interests, uh, both at home and abroad. Steve? Yeah, no, look, likewise, I would say, um, you know, I wouldn't separate them out. I, I think they have to be interrelated. You know, the idea that you would, for example, look at digital rights as your sort of preeminent issue and ignore the economic, the commercial implications of that, or or the security, I think, you know, wouldn't wouldn't add up. I mean, I'll give you a, a good case in point. Like, look at something like the Digital Services Act or the Digital Markets Act. You know, which have just been proposed by the EU. Uh, you know, on the surface, they are very much economic oriented. Uh, proposals that look at the power of gatekeeping platforms uh, and seek to find ways to get around and push back on the kind of monopoly power uh, that they that they have, uh, particularly uh, in the European context. But they also relate very significantly uh, to digital rights issues as well, in terms of which voices uh, and uh, are able to come out, content moderation issues. Uh, the extent to which they are uh, responsible for fomenting polarization uh, in the political context. And so to that end, certainly when it comes, I think, especially when you look at sort of the information space, when you look at the power of social media platforms and internet tech giants that, that are here now, uh, it's impossible to separate out one from the other. And, and frankly, I think 
you know, before we're able to get into uh, a tech alliance and build one, uh, particularly with European partners, we're going to need to have a, a pretty candid conversation about where some of these separate efforts are headed and to what extent we can find ways to bring in uh, some common viewpoints uh, when it comes to uh, how to deal with really thorny issues uh, when it comes to uh, specific companies, uh, the power of the marketplace that are inherent in terms of how they operate, uh, and some really um, tough questions when it comes to social media uh, in particular. Tough questions, frankly, that um, you know we have so far avoided answering domestically. And yet I think we're reaching a point right now where we can no longer afford to let that to hive that off, but that we have to confront kind of that simultaneously, both in, in the international context as well as uh, at home. Yeah, so yeah, I'd actually like to, to speak to that um, because Stephen's right, like at home, we are having a very, a very interesting and passionate debate around Section 230, privacy, competition um, on the commercial side, which is my area of expertise, and then beyond that on government surveillance and how all of that can work as well, right? So it's very, because I worked in the Senate for many years, the, I really guard that institutions role in our government. It is not the executive branch's role to make new law, we can proffer a new law, but it is the legislature's role to make new law. And it's very difficult for a, an executive agency to go abroad and advocate for something that is not yet law in the United States. Right. So to the degree that we're going to have these conversations prior to us coming to some sort of domestic consensus on what modern law should look like in the digital age, we need to focus on issues of process. So are our, our, our companies or human beings as citizens being treated fairly in the regulatory and legal processes abroad, if, even if those processes are different from ours. So take, for example, um, digital services taxes, right? The EU is moving forward. They're not alone. There's probably like 30 countries that want to move forward digital services taxes. The, United, the, the role of the United States government is not to be an extension of the government relations arm of Google, Facebook, and Apple. That's not our, that's not our role. But it is our role to ensure that American companies are not discriminated against by design in law, right? So to the degree that we're going to object or support foreign law, whether it's digital services taxes in Europe or the Australian law on news, it should be focused on process. Did, did all stakeholders receive a fair hearing? Is the outcome rational? And to the, to the degree we wanna offer opinions on whether it's good or bad policy, we can, but we do have to respect the authority of nations to make law and regulation for themselves. And then we have to work really hard together to make sure that these markets remain interoperable. It sounds like what you're saying is allow some space for some divergence in policy because countries will approach these things differently, but have a common set of, have, have a process, have a common set of norms by which we guide this this policy making. Um, I mean, that's uh, that's I think a good example of that is is between the EU and the United States right now. You mentioned digital services taxes, privacy shield, and how we're trying to re renegotiate that. Um, but I'm wondering if you know if we, as Danny suggests, if we fix our house first, we we decide what our privacy law is, how we're going to handle big um, competition and amongst the big digital giants, and also. Um, speech issues online, if we solve that first, um, don't we just uh, create an opportunity for China to extend its reach to continue to promote its uh, authoritarian internet model? And can we do both things at the same time? Maybe over to Steve. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that a solution is immediately on the horizon, unfortunately. I think that at this point, you know, Part of the reason that we haven't seen the kind of action that we'd like to uh, on the Hill out of Congress is that there, there really is a breakdown in consensus, uh, and and you know that that's going to take time to work through. Now I don't know if it's a breakdown in consensus as a result of the last administration and the fact that they were both uninterested uh, in doing anything constructive on the issue. In fact, uh, I would argue the opposite that they like purposely uh, inflamed the conversation and that we're able to kind of move past that. Uh, you know, under under uh, Biden's leadership. Uh, to, you know, with conversations of the Hill and actually get somewhere, I don't know. But uh, what I do know right now is that, uh, you know, real policy movement 
uh, has not been easy. Uh, and and I, I'm not sure that we, you know, ourselves know exactly what we'd like to see. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's one, one issue. So I think you're right, Robert, in the sense that waiting to fully rationalize what we're going to do at home uh, and in the meantime, sort of hitting the pause button abroad doesn't make sense in terms of our national interest. And certainly when it comes to the broader challenges we face on the digital front with China and other adversaries, um, you know, I think that could be, you know, strolling to, to our detriment. But I also do think that it's important to kind of separate out what we're talking about, because, you know, when it comes to the power of internet platforms and how they operate, I mean, that's a little less of a question vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, you know, because those platforms don't operate in China. And frankly, I'm not so sure when we look at sort of head-to-head -head competition and, you know, WeChat or some of these other uh, Chinese platforms sort of making encroaching in different areas. I'm not so sure that that's the relevant question so much as it is other issues when it comes to China's uh, continuing lead uh, or not lead, but continuing viability and in artificial intelligence when it comes to the surveillance tech that it exports when it comes to other systems of digital control that uh, it, it's showcasing and developing. I think these are sort of slightly different issues. And so I think there is a way to kind of handle, look at kind of both, both sides of those. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Steve. And I think that where we should start is by agreeing as techno democracies, for, for lack of a better term, on what we disagree with, what we are united in our opposition to. And I think we would be united in our opposition to the idea that China should control any critical infrastructure for global technology or communications, or any key component of that, like artificial intelligence, or take the lead in that space. So cooperation in ensuring that we as um, open and the open open societies, open democracies, um, work together to ensure that that doesn't happen. I think that's a unifying principle on which we can build. As to what's going on at home, I think we're actually pretty close on private. I would be surprised if we don't have a federal privacy law within the next two years. When, when I went to Congress in 2000, in 1999, the Clinton Federal Trade Commission had called for a national privacy law for the internet. And we were gonna get, get it done by 2002, obviously didn't happen. Kerry and McCain, I staffed John Kerry on the Kerry and McCain privacy bill. We had seven hearings and industry thought it was too restrictive. Civil society thought it wasn't restrictive enough, so it didn't move anywhere. The Obama administration produced a consumer privacy bill of rights. Again, no movement. But in the last two years, we've seen Mr. Wicker and Ms. Cantwell, who were then ranking in, in chair and had reversed, uh, actually working pretty close together and have, having not that much of a delta left on what a federal privacy law should look like. And that was actually driven largely by the pressure from a California privacy law becoming the de facto law of the land and Congress wanting to reassert its interstate commerce authority over privacy and commerce in the United States. I think on section 230 and on some of the competition issues, we're a little bit further away from resolution, um, but that's because they're really, really, really hard issues. Right, hard and very divisive issues, but it's good to hear your optimism about some national privacy uh, law in, in in the United States. I know here in the state of Virginia, where I'm standing right now, there's a there's a new new piece of legislation as well. So the the states will go where the federal government has has not so far. Um, we've talked a little bit about commerce, and um, I know your experience in industry, Danny. And I was just thinking, you know, how will industry? Will, do you see industry supporting such an initiative, or will they be wary and do they want to hedge their bets? in terms of they want to keep um, access or business to China, those that have it, or, or will, they, will they really get behind an idea like this and, and see it in, in their best interests? It's, it's a broad question, so you can answer that however you want. You know, I spent 20 years of my life um, working in government before I actually came into the private sector. And when I was working in government, when I thought about industry, it really meant to me the large commonly known brands, the, the Googles, Facebooks of the world, Apple. But industry is so much more diverse than that, um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of companies compose, have an interest in the outcomes of, of these debates. And it's not just the, the traditional big tech companies. So uh, I think it's, it's super important to try to harness that debate and conversation and harness voices from the diversity of what constitutes entrepreneurship and, and industry. Uh, but at the end of the day, governing is the responsibility of governments. And we have to start making some decisions about how we want our values executed in, in law. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, 
it's no longer a nascent industry. It's no longer an, a, a new development that we want to see how it's going to play out. But we have a responsible, policymakers have a responsibility to start laying down some ground rules for, for the digital age. And it's happening. It's happening, again, sort of organically in patches. Um, and maybe that's the only way it can happen. But I do think that to the degree that we can have higher level exchanges of ideas, exchanges of communications, and some real thought around what we want to achieve, as Steve said, in terms of objectives and common values, uh, that that would be worth doing. And I think industry w w agrees with that as a general rule. Mm -hmm. Steve, what do you think? How do we harness the power of industry and their ideas and innovation behind uh, what Danny calls a, a government responsibility? Yeah, no, I, I agree with what Danny said. I think that's the right approach. And you know, I think part of it too is, is that, you know, I think industry wants to see reliability. Uh, they want to see a common set of rules and a better, uh, a more coherent understanding when it comes to the public sector leadership about where the U.S. stands, how to get other partners behind that, uh, and you know what what are the, the kind of you know core values that uh, you know we will bring and advance on a host of different issues. I think that to the extent that we can actually have more consistency in our approach, as opposed to what has, you know, especially in the last few years, been much more haphazard and somewhat governed by impulse as opposed to governed by a strategic process and design. I think that'll help uh, much more. So, I mean, let's be concrete and specific for a second. You know, I think when it comes to some of the uh, uh, initiatives and executive orders we've seen vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, some have seemed to come out of thin air. Uh, they seem to be more reactions to um, pronouncements uh, or speeches that have uh, come as opposed to a deeper assessment of what needs are. So everything from, you know, uh, you know, efforts to ban TikTok uh, and WeChat, um, you know, sort of other things along those lines where uh, a lot of experts, a lot of policymakers were caught by surprise in terms of what the actual consequences of these actions were. So coming up with a more deliberate process, bringing in a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, including uh, incorporating allies to buy in, uh, at least you know de the democracies to buy in to uh, this this strategy, uh, and then being consistent upon its application. Uh, I think these are all things that I would assume uh, industry would welcome. Great, thanks, Steve. We we have um, some questions that have been submitted from our participants, and I'd like to uh, to read one of them, uh, and it's it pertains to low and middle income countries and that they represent um, the vast majority of the undecided countries. And they're still working on extending their digital infrastructure and approaches to data government. So how could we, um, as the you know, developed um, uh, nations of the OECD countries, um, how can we work with, uh, with the low and middle income countries to address their aspirations, ensuring the digital economy fuels economic growth? open to either of you. I'll take an initial swing. Uh, um, so I, look, it's a great question. Uh, and it kind of builds on a point that, you know, I've, I've touched on in some of the, the pieces I've written, uh, which is that, you know, I, I firmly believe that, especially when you look at, at these issues from a democracy governance lens, uh, that you know, the, the key issue, if you're trying to counter uh, China's influence in the digital space, uh, is to make sure that you're being inclusive, that you are in, uh, encompassing not only sort of the next tier of swing states, like your larger your countries like India, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, and so forth, but going beyond that as well to uh, other countries that uh, whose, you know, digital uh, infrastructure is more nascent, but who are you know, will be important players uh, in the coming years. You know, this is where a lot of the struggle is taking place and where, frankly, uh, initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative, Digital Silk Road, other types of investments taking place from China uh, in the tech space, whether it's building out network infrastructure, uh, 5G or so forth, uh, is really taking root. This is where I think we, uh, democracies writ large, need to invest more. Uh, th I think it'll matter, it matters now it'll matter more in the future. So to that extent, uh, I think, uh, you know, we would overlook uh, low and lower and middle income countries uh, at our peril. Uh, I think whether or not 
you design an alliance that has a core membership, uh, and it, but then sort of it more widely uh, encapsulates uh, a much larger swath of countries or whether you decide from the beginning to make it uh, a larger type of membership. In either case, I think uh, it's absolutely critical to make sure that it's touching upon countries beyond the kind of core liberal democracies in, in uh, East Asia, uh, in Europe and North America that we otherwise deal with on a regular basis anyway, who have developed infrastructures, uh, more developed industries and, and, a, and a more concrete set of values in, in which uh, you know, industries stand. Great, so I, I agree with all of that. And um, I would say that, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time working with the, with the Global South uh, when I was at state. Um, I have a particular interest in the development of Latin America, but Africa and Southeast Asia as well. And to the degree that the digital economy or, or, or the, it, we can't allow the digital economy to, to have the same kind of effects on global inequality that the industrial economy had. We can't allow the kind of concentration of wealth and opportunity to reside um, in only one part of the world or in only one nation. Um, and much, and to, to do that, we need to have a concerted strategy for both aid and trade and investment abroad um, to, to, to develop the digital, the internal digital economies, the infrastructure at least, and then the digital skills on which to build on that infrastructure abroad and to do so in a thoughtful and coordinated way. Um, because what China is doing right now is just carrying money around the world, and subsidizing the development of infrastructure. And I don't think we can compete and we're not going to subsidize private actors to build networks abroad to the degree that China does, but we should think very, very seriously about how to create financing incentives and financing mechanisms for developing countries to access uh, the infrastructure that comes from the United States and Europe and, and elsewhere uh, to ensure that we don't have a, a an expansion of the sort of both oversight over the infrastructure and the leveraging of the infrastructure that the Chinese government has at home all over the world. It sounds like uh, we could probably expect the Biden administration to double down on the uh, Development Finance Corporation, the DFC, I think, which, which is geared towards uh, balancing the playing field a little bit. Um, but this brings me to another question about industry and trade. And this comes from Sada Ito at the um, Japan Ministry of Industry and Trade. Um, he asks, uh, how does yesterday's executive order on supply chain review come into play with this tech alliance plan? There was a press conference yesterday with uh, Peter Harrell from the NSC and Jen Psaki, where they announced um, an executive order on supply chain review. And I wondered what your, your thoughts were on that, how it how this, how this might tie together. Stephen, right, I think that um, I, I've known Peter for, for many years and, and Jen as well. And, and I think that this, this announcement is really a declaration of ensuring that, all, that we are not excessively dependent on any one source for critical inputs to our supply chains in this space um, and, and in, in associated spaces. And uh, so, so in that sense, it ties extremely well into this conversation. And a part of that analysis is gonna be um, who shares our values and where can we have redundant networks and redundant supply chains to ensure stability um, and ensure that we're not at the mercy of any one supplier. Steve, thoughts on that? Let me just yeah add a, another point. This is actually relates a little more to, to what we were just talking about in terms of and it actually looks at supply chains when it comes to a uh, country's own decision making and the role of China, you know, which is that, um, you know, I think we certainly face a challenge when it comes to China's abilities to, to subsidize uh, in a broad way uh, technologies for critical infrastructure uh, in developing countries around the world. Uh, you know, I, for the book uh, I wrote that's coming out uh, in April, I went to places like the Philippines, Thailand, Ethiopia. I talked to Different uh, senior officials uh, in the, you know, trade ICT infrastructure ministries, uh, and they, you know, what's interesting is that there's sort of a few different incentives uh, or motivations that they have. So on the one hand, they need to access technology uh, in, in a cost-efficient manner. 
uh, countries like uh, Ethiopia in the Philippines are trying to rush ahead as fast as they can to build out their digital infrastructure. Uh, and they have limited resources available at their disposal. So if the Chinese are coming more quickly, which oftentimes they are, and, there, and the cost of Chinese products are 40 to 50% those of comparable products from Western firms, it's a pretty, pretty easy decision from their end in terms of who they're gonna go with. Now, but the other kind of issue that I found interesting is that certainly cost uh, can be paramount uh, in a lot of these situations. But there's also a wariness that a lot of these countries have to solely going in with China. And so there is a willingness on their part, uh, I think a desire to counterbalance uh, purchasing equipment from China with, with technology from other countries, particularly those uh, you know, tr more trusted democratic partners where there are longstanding bilateral relationships, even if it's gonna be a little slower, maybe a little more costly, but it depends. And, and I think what, we can do from a U.S. perspective is we can we can help. I don't think we're going to get to a point where we're going to match, uh, particularly on subsidies, uh, what China can do for a number of reasons. But we can we can we can uh, fill that gap just enough so that this idea of hedging uh, by these countries, the idea that maybe uh, of rethinking whether uh, you know going uh, exclusively with with Chinese technology is the right way to go uh, for different infrastructural components is something that they want to rethink. And I think that's where, whether it's the DFC, other types of policies uh, that the Biden administration uh, comes up with, I think that's where we can help make up the difference. And if we can do that together with other democratic partners, then that's even more ways that we can leverage pushing back against uh, Chinese encroachment. Uh, clearly, it looks like there's a lot of work to be done by many agencies in the executive branch since this, this uh, challenge has so many different pieces of it. And Danny alluded uh, earlier to different functions at the State Department, and I wondered what your recommendations would be as the administration is uh, building, continues to build out its team as to how the interagency can work together on, on an issue that spans commerce and security and human rights, and, and where should that center of, of gravity be? Um, White House, NSC, State, Treasury, Commerce, others. Um, it's, a, it's an open, uh, open question, and we welcome your thoughts on that. Um, I know there's been some initiatives on Capitol Hill to create some new structures as well. So if we could, I'd love to have your views on, on, on structures within the U.S. government. So um, like you said, because it's such an inherently cross-agency uh, challenge, the, the locus of, of decision-making and authority should come from the White House in, in, through an NEC, NSC coordinated process. And different agencies should take different lead roles on execution and oper oper operating what those policies are and obviously provide input to them. The global competitiveness aspects of it should probably come out of commerce in terms of policies and thought leadership with representation and execution led by state in coordination with commerce. On cybersecurity issues, you really do have to bring in defense and homeland security into those conversations. Uh, there has been discussion about having uh, a, a new bureau at the State Department that would incorporate my old office as well as Chris Painter's old office and house it under P uh, or the political undersecretary in order to ensure that you get the balancing of the interests across the variety of, of stakeholders that are involved in any given question. Um, and then I, I support that concept. Uh, I, I know that there are, there are different points of view on it, um, but I, I think that that would be a good way to go. But again, I, I think uh, the NEC NSC process should should be the coordinating body. Would this new bureau at State Department handle the digital economy and cyber? Is that did I did I hear you correctly on that? Yeah, that the, that's the idea. The idea is that you know you essentially you would have a an assistant secretary ambassador Senate confirmed position and then you would have probably three deputies one for security one for commerce and one for human rights um and these this is not a new idea uh, the economic bureau rejected it because they didn't want to lose an office uh, drl rejected it because they didn't want to lose an office and security at that time was was a uh, you know, reported directly to the secretary and didn't want to report to anybody else, right? So the, the nature of this is that with without people with embedded self-interest in the office now, it's that is probably the best and most important time for the administration to just say, look, we're going to do this. 
and everybody who's coming in has to be on board with what we're going to do. Right. Steve, uh, your thoughts on, on the uh, structures within the US government? You've served in a couple of the bureaus that we've mentioned today. Yeah, no, look, I, look, I think first and foremost, uh, it, it certainly makes sense to me that you would want to have something centralized from the White House perspective. And I think that would give you two things. Number one, you know, when you look kind of out in terms of your foreign policy, mm -hmm. there are enough uh, stakeholders uh, in the USG from DOD to Commerce to the State Department, uh, you know, USAID and many others where you'd want to have uh, at least a way to really coordinate uh, those functions uh, and have everyone on the same page. Uh, when it comes to what we're doing across security, economic, and digital rights issues. So I think that makes a ton of sense. I think the other thing you would get from having kind of a, whether it's a dual hat NSC, NEC, uh, or something else that would maybe have a link to this, uh, you know, science and technology uh, group at the White House is also to, to, to see if you can bridge over to the domestic side as well. You know, as we've talked about some of these issues when it comes to platform accountability, when it comes to uh, the role of, 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 of some of these larger social media companies spans, uh, you know, uh, a variety of issues, both domestic and, and international. So to the extent that you're able to kind of incorporate some of those facets as well, I think that's a really important thing. I mean, I think the bottom line is that if you just ask yourself a, a basic question, particularly from like, let's say a State Department diplomacy perspective, which is that as uh, Secretary Blinken and others talk about the idea of bringing together techno democracies and you sort of say, okay, what are the issues that span that? And who do I call, right? Who's going to lead that, that initiative? You know, the Secretary of State asked for it. Well, who's responsible for implementing it? Uh, and you know, from my perspective, this new bureau can play a central role uh, in doing that. And to the extent that it can incorporate the different aspects uh, to how you would want to approach digital issues from the security to the economic and the uh, you know, digital rights side, that's great. I mean, it doesn't mean that you lose that completely from EB or you lose that completely from DRL. I think the roles of these uh, bureaus will continue to be what they've always been, which is to keep uh, others honest on these issues. So to that extent, you know, you don't have to completely lose DRL's team when it comes to internet freedom. I think it's important to, you know, maintain a core that can push uh, and make sure that everyone's sort of playing on the right side when it comes to moving things forward. At the same time, you know, we absolutely need a locus of gravity, uh, you know, in the State Department and other places uh, to really make sense and, and be productive uh, when it comes to uh, setting out a, uh, in a, a robust agenda. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that perspective, Steve. Um, wanted to ask about uh, President Biden's uh, announcement that there would be a summit of democracy or democracies at some point during his, his term here. Um, and uh, I can see these issues coming up in that. And it's always government folks love having a deliverable for big summits and big conferences. So <laughs> Uh, can you see a, a deliverable? Um, would you recommend uh, that they use this uh, event to launch a, a, a new initiative, a new framework of democracies, techno democracies? And just what are your thoughts on uh, what should be on the agenda if you, if the uh, president and the vice president asked your views? <laughs> I'll, I'll take this question first because the democracy side. You know, it's a it's a very broad con concept right now, and. I think there, there are, so I think the, the question I've heard is, is, is it gonna be sort of symbolically a, a one-off, which is fine in the sense of saying we're back, we wanna take leadership on, on you know, the sort of value side of policy. We feel an important need to kind of reassert uh, US interest on these issues. And then you spawn a number of initiatives that come from that, but you don't necessarily sort of go back to this as a grouping that reconvenes every few years. Or is it something that's sort of more of an ongoing basis uh, where you sort of use it as a kind of a framing that, you know, in two years you, you reconvene and four years you reconvene as a way to kind of keep people on the same page. My sense is that it's gonna be more the former rather than the latter. That'll be kind of more of a one-off, but then you could spawn different uh, configurations based on the, the initial gathering. And if that's the case, uh, I would certainly argue that, that having um, a side that looks specifically at the digital would be important. I mean, on the one hand, I would say that at, at this point, when it comes to how you think about democracy and human rights, separating out technological issues doesn't really make sense. It, it's all kind of part of the same, the same mix. Uh, but you know, I do think a little more of an emphasis uh, from the, the digital rights side to think about these issues specifically, 
how they relate, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, what we can do to, to bring about more responsible use uh, uh, and approaches from different countries. I think that, that'll be uh, an important thing. One aspect I would note is this, the larger you make the Summit for Democracies, uh, the more you're gonna run into a bit of a buzzsaw when it comes to these digital rights issues in particular. A uh, quick example, look at India. Uh, I, I think it's highly unlikely that India wouldn't be invited to a Summit for Democracies. Uh, it's also um, you know, uh, in a moment right now where there are some troubling illiberal trends uh, taking place in the country. And there's some really difficult tech issues at play, including the Indian government's pushback against Twitter when it comes to taking down content that it feels is uh, uh, runs uh, violates uh, international uh, national law, but which Twitter I think rightly is pushing back and saying you know this is uh, part of the free expression and we need to keep this stuff up. Uh, you know, it, it's to me the idea of forging consensus among a large group who are promulgating very different sets of policies on some core digital rights issues uh, is something that the the Biden team will need to figure out. That answer made me really miss working with Steve because there's really nothing I could disagree with in that. I think it's a sound analysis and a sound uh, sound recommendation. Um, I, yeah, I really would have nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> My takeaway from Steve's comment was- I miss Danny. Uh, you, let's, let's bring the team back at some point. <laughs> I, I wrote down big tent equals buzzsaw. And also that it's, it's gonna be hard to, uh, to, to get consensus on some of these issues. Maybe they could, do a, a, a democracy summit where you have breakout sessions to solve the Twitter problem in India or to solve the transatlantic you know, um, uh, data sharing. And, and then it could be a, a, a long event, I think. Um, it would have to be a two year breakout session. Like, <laughs> it's gonna take a long time right. for us in India to decide on you know, what, are, what should be the common parameters for speech allowed on a private network because Twitter is a private enterprise. Twitter can allow or disallow out within the boundaries of law anything they wish, you know. And so, it's a uh, these are all super super hard questions, but you know they're not again without precedent. At the OECD, we agreed to OECD principles on privacy. At the World Summit on the Information Society, we agreed to a whole bunch of principles across, and that was a whole UN process. And you know you get there at some point by agreeing to disagree or by agreeing to language that is so vague as to everyone can perceive it through the lens of how they were going to govern anyway. But the process and the exercise itself is useful. Um, and I think that I, I, whatever we do with a techno democracies movement or initiative, you can't think of it as we're going to come together and solve these problems. Like mm -hmm. it's more of um, an institution setting for a really long term plan of agreeing that we want to solve these problems together and have interoperability and interconnectivity and open societies and open exchanges. Uh, but I do think that it would be a really good reset for us to come as the United States to a group of democracies and say, you know, the press is not the enemy of the people. A free press is critical to, to society, that elections should be free, fair, and open. That, you know, some of the basic things that we took for granted um, when we were in office, uh, and and that the world took for granted about the United States have to be restored. That's great. Thank you, thank you for that, Danny. Um, in the few minutes we have left, I wondered if you could both share with us what you're working on next in this space. Um, I know Stephen has a book uh, coming out fairly soon, uh, so I want to hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, so I have a book called The Rise of Digital Repression, uh, how technology is reshaping politics, power, uh, and resistance. Uh, so it's coming out April 13th. Uh, you can pre-order uh, right now on Amazon, uh, but uh, it really looks at kind of uh, around the world, uh, what these different trends, uh, particularly related to autocratic governments using and exploring technology to help solidify their governance and advance their objectives. What does that look like? Is that, you know, uh, how are they using surveillance techniques? How are they using disinformation? How are they using other types of uh, these new tools as a means to consolidate their power. Uh, so it includes three of the case studies I mentioned from Ethiopia, Philippines, and Thailand, uh, but it also looks at data around the world and tries to look at patterns and relationships based on that. Uh, so more to come. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention too is that um, via Carnegie, uh, I've spent a lot of time putting together 
uh, a group uh, of researchers from around the world. Uh, we're calling it the Digital Democracy Network. Uh, so it's people who are looking at everything from surveillance issues, internet controls, from India to uh, Nigeria, to Uganda, to Argentina, Turkey, uh, uh, Thailand, a host of other countries. Uh, and you know we're looking to launch a sort of initial report in a few months uh, and then more uh, subsequently. But it's also a way to kind of think comparatively uh, from a local country context, what do these issues mean uh, in swing states? What do they mean when you look at kind of the power of platforms from Indonesia's perspective? Uh, and to kind of bring in new ideas uh, and, and you know, uh, uh, new proposals about how we sort of grapple with uh, technology's effects on politics. So that's something to, to watch out for as well. It's great. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading Steve's book. Um, I've read books, I've never written one, and I, I don't think I ever will. That my, my next steps are to, uh, I'm gonna go work for a large global uh, publishing and education company. And it, it marries two of the things that I'm deeply passionate about, which is skill development and education as a tool for upward mo economic mobility, as well as um, intellectual property and interoperable data markets uh, in the space. And so we're gonna continue working, I'm gonna continue working in this space with the hopes of, uh, of ensuring that, you know, the private sector is a contributing actor to, to solving these challenges in a, in a positive and constructive way with government. That's great. Thanks, Danny. And our CEO, Glenn Nye, is back for a uh, final wrap up, I believe. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Robert, for um, your able moderation of the discussion. Really, really great discussion. Um, Danny and Steve, thank you for, the, for raising a lot of points. I think you helped us frame the issue in a new way, um, called us up to where we need to be um, as of today. Obviously, a lot is developing right now. Um, with a new administration that is in the process of staffing up. They've laid out some ideas, um, defined some of the direction they want to go, um, but there's a lot of questions still as to how they're going to do that, how they're going to implement that. W one thing I'd love to do, if I could just ask in like 30 seconds or less, both of you, um, if you were given sort of the, the magic wand from the president um, and, and you could define the next or first step here, what do you think is the most important thing that has to happen to get this rolling? So just boil it down to like, what would be the first or next thing you think we need to see happen to get us moving in, in the right direction? And maybe I can just start with Danny on that. Yeah, I, I think you need to assign a quarterback at the NSC and NEC to start bringing the agencies together on this process. And I, I think you need to elevate the portfolio at the sister agencies at state, commerce, Department of Homeland Security uh, and defense, it, just to ensure that um, justice. I mean, the, all of these issues, and I've been watching all of the administration nominees confirmation hearings, and they all are asked about tech and telecom issues. They're all asked about internet and digital economy issues, all of them. I mean, even the Secretary of Interior was asked about how are you going to get broadband out to tribal communities and rural communities. This is the foundation of the, of, of the economy and society, and it needs to be reflected uh, within, within our governing uh, composition. Yeah, thank you. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say similarly. I, would th I think it'd be interesting uh, if the president came out with a presidential policy directive uh, that actually assigned and made a priority these very issues in terms of coming up with a digital strategy, uh, including building up an alliance structure that would directly encompass and focus uh, these efforts and give a charge to all the, the relevant agencies in the US government to, uh, to put this at the top of their priority list. I think uh, a PPD along those lines, early, early on the first six to 12 months uh, of the administration would do a lot of good. Yeah, no, I really appreciate your answer on that because, and this is, I think one of the reasons why we as a think tank engaged on this particular topic, because it's one of those things where it is an issue that's so vitally important and urgent that a huge array of players across the US government space own some piece of it, and yet nobody owns all of it. And so it, it requires a lot of coordination. Um, it, it will take White House leadership. I think you both identified that very clearly today. Uh, we are hoping that um, we, from the perspective of the think tank community, in continuing to host our series of discussions on this and bringing folks from both several areas of the administration, but also from Congress, uh, as Danny pointed out um, rightly uh, earlier today, 
um, to try to keep folks moving in generally the same direction. I really appreciate your thoughts on helping us distill some of this because I think as Steve said, well, if you try to make a summit and you cover everything and you invite everyone, you know, you really aren't gonna get anywhere. You've got to kind of make some judicious decisions about how to proceed. So it's, it's a complex but important issue. We're looking forward to continuing the series um, and bringing in some folks from inside the administration um, in some of our upcoming rounds. But let me just say thank you so much to the two of you. You, you have obviously put a lot of thought into this and you've lived it yourselves uh, under a prior administration. So I really appreciate you spending the time with our audience today to help uh, inform our thoughts and our process. And, and uh, Steve, good luck with your book. And uh, Danny, good luck with your next steps. And we, we look forward to uh, visiting with you again. And to our participants, thank you for joining us for this conversation today. Um, I wish everybody the best. Be safe and be well, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Good to see you guys. Thank you all. Thank you.